Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to take a look at how we can add passwordless login to ASP.NET Core 8 identity using FIDO2. Now, as you can see here, I've gone on ahead and created a solution with a web application project. Within this project, we have a couple of FIDO2 related things already configured. And I'll just go over those briefly now for you. So inside our app settings.development.json, we have our FIDO2 app settings. As you can see here, we have the list of origins. We have our server domain, our server name, and our timestamp drift tolerance. Next up, within our program.csharp file, we set up our application DB context. We add default identity with our application user and our application DB context. We also add in a distributed memory cache. We add the FIDO2 related services, passing in the configuration from our app settings. We add razor pages, and then we also add session related services into our application. Within the data directory, you can see that we have our application DB context class, we have our application user, and we also have our FIDO2 related entities. And then within our, within our migrations directory, we have our initial create identity schema migration and our add FIDO2 related entities migration. Within the handlers directory, we have our FIDO2 handler class, and within this class, we have a method to create an attestation. And we also have a method to create attestation options. And then at the bottom, we have our create attestation options input model class. Now then, the first thing that we are going to want to do is update the FIDO2 handler to add a couple of methods to handle assertions. So the attestations are what are used during registration, and then the assertions are used during login. So what we are going to want to do, first of all, is we're going to want to create an input model class for our assertion options. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a public class, and I'm going to call this create assertion options input model like so and within this class we're going to have a public required string property and this is going to be called a username with our getter and setter and then we're also going to have a property for the user verification requirement this is just going to be called user verification like so we say get and set, and we're going to default this value to user verification requirement dot preferred if none is specified. Next up, we're going to create the method itself that will create the assertion options. So what we're going to do is we're going to say a public static async this is going to return a task of type OK, and the OK is going to be of type assertion options. And I'm going to call this method create assertion options, like so. Now this method is going to take in a handful of parameters. The first one is going to be a parameter for the FIDO2 service. Next up, we're going to want a parameter for the HTTP context. After that, we're going to want to create a parameter from the request body. And this is going to be our create assertion options input model. And I'm just going to call that input. Next up, we're going to want to uh, inject in the user manager. And then last but not least, we can have a cancellation token, 
with a default value there if none is provided. So what we're going to do within this method is we're going to take the username and optional user verification and we're going to use those two inputs in order to create assertion options. And these assertion options will then be used to display a browser UI to prompt the user for a public key credential in order to log in. So first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to say var normalized username equals user manager dot normalized name. And then we're going to pass in the input dot username like so. And this is going to convert the username into normalized form. Next up, we're going to say var allowed credentials equals await user manager dot users and then we're going to say where and the where user dot normalized username equals the normalized username that we just created and then we're going to say select many and then within here we say user dot public key credentials and then we will, using those public key credentials, we're going to select a new public key credential descriptor, like so. And we're going to pass in the identifier for the credential. And then last but not least, we're going to say to list async, and then we're going to pass in the cancellation token. And we just fix that there to be a select rather than a select many. And this is going to return us a list of allowed credentials that we have stored in our database for that particular username or an empty list if the username is not recognized. Next up, we're going to create a variable to store the extensions. And this is going to be a var extensions equals and then we're going to say authentication extensions client inputs, like so. We're going to set the extensions property to true. We're going to set the user verification method to true. And then we're also going to new up an instance of authentication extensions device public key inputs for the device pub key property, like so. Now what we're going to do is we're going to say var options equals and then we're going to say FIDO2 dot get assertion options. And we're going to pass in our allowed credentials as the first parameter for this method. Then we're going to pass in the input dot user verification like so. And then finally, we're going to pass in the extensions. Next up, what we're going to want to do is we're going to take those options and we're going to store them in the session. And that's because we're going to want to retrieve them later on from the session when we create the assertion itself. So in order to do this, what we're going to do is say HTTP context dot session dot set string. And I'm going to call this FIDO2 assertion options like so. Just pop the A in there. And then I'm going to say options dot to JSON, like so, in order to convert the options object into a JSON string that we can then uh, set in the session. Last but not least, we can then say return typed results dot OK. And then we can pass in our options as the parameter for the OK result. So this method here will allow us to create assertion options that the browser will then use when it displays the UI for the user to select a previously created public key credential. So now what we're going to do is we're going to add a method called create assertion and this is going to take the public key credential from the browser 
and it's then going to uh, verify it within our database and we will then use it to log in the user. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a public static async method. This is going to return a task of type results and results is going to be of type bad request and also OK with verify assertion result like so. This method will be called uh, create assertion. And then we're going to want to specify a few different parameters. So the first parameter that we're going to want is our application DB context. Next up from the request body, we're going to specify authenticator assertion raw response. And I'm just going to call this assertion response like so. And then next up, we're going to want our FIDO2 service. We're also going to want the HTTP context. We're then going to add in the sign in manager like so. And alongside the sign in manager, we are going to want the user manager. And then last but not least, we can specify a cancellation token with a default like so. Those are the different parameters that we are going to want for our create assertion method. And now we can make a start on implementing the body for this method. So the first thing that we are going to want to do is we're going to want to retrieve the FIDO2 assertion options from the session. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say var JSON equals HTTP context dot session dot get string. And then I'm going to say FIDO2 assertion options like so. Next up, we're going to do a check to see if JSON is either null or an empty string. And in the scenario that it is, we're going to return typed results dot bad request to indicate to the client that they first of all need to create the assertion options and have those stored in the session before calling the create assertion method. Next up, we can say var options equals assertion options dot from JSON, like so. And next up, we are going to want to use the assertion response that we get provided by the client to look up the credential if it exists in the database. So what we're going to do is we're going to say var credential equals and then we say await user manager dot users. And then what we're going to do is we're going to select many. And then we're going to say user dot public key credentials. And then we're going to specify include. And within here, we're going to include the credential device public keys like so. And then we're going to say a single or default async. And within the function for the single or default, what we're going to do is we're going to check to see if the ID of the credential equals the ID of the assertion response, like so. And then we can also pass in the cancellation token as the second parameter for the call to single or default async. So what this is going to do is it's going to select the single credential from the database that matches the ID that we get provided in the assertion response from the client. Or if a credential is not found, then it will simply default to null. So in the case that a, a corresponding credential is not found in the database, then we can assume that the login attempt is unsuccessful and we can therefore return a bad request. So what we're going to do is we're going to say if credential is null, then we can return a typed results dot bad request like so. Next up, if we have the credential and the credential is not null, then we can use the user ID 
on the credential in order to look up the user who the credential uh, corresponds to. So what we're going to do is we're going to say var user equals await user manager dot find by id async and then we're going to say credential dot user id like so and much the same as we did for credential we're going to do a check to ensure that the user is not null if the user is null then we will simply return a bad request much like we do if the credential is null so the next thing that we are going to do is we're going to take the options and also the credential and we're going to use the FIDO2 service to make an assertion. So what I am going to do is I'm going to say var assertion result equals await FIDO2 dot make assertion async. And first and foremost, we're going to pass in the assertion response that we get from the client. We're then going to pass in the options that we retrieve from the session. We're then going to pass in the public key of the credential. We're then also going to pass in the device public keys that we retrieved from the database. And to do that, we're going to say credential dot device public keys. And then we're going to select the value of the key like so. And then we will just convert that to a list. Next up, we're going to pass in the signature counter of the credential. You may recall previously we covered on how the signature counter will get incremented each time the credential is used during the authentication flow. And next up, we're going to pass in a callback function that will check to see if the user is the owner of the credential. So what we're going to do is we're going to specify an asynchronous callback function the first uh, argument there will be uh, params like so. And then we're also going to specify the cancellation token like so. And within this callback function, we are going to say await user manager dot users. And then we're going to say where. And then in here, we're going to say user dot ID equals new a GUID and we're going to pass in the user handle that we get from the params object and then we're going to convert that to a byte array. Uh, sorry not a byte array that's going to be to string uh, like so. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say select many and then we're going to select the public key credentials for that particular user. And then we're going to say any async. And then we're going to say where the credential ID is equal to params dot credential ID, like so. We'll also pass in the cancellation token as the second parameter for the any async method call. And then last but not least, as the final uh, parameter for make assertion async, we can pass in our cancellation token like so. And what this is going to do, if it's successful, is it will generate an assertion for us that we can then uh, use to update some of the properties on our stored credential. So if the assertion was made successfully, then what we're going to do first of all is we're going to update the signature counter of our stored credential. So what we're going to do is we're going to say credential dot signature counter equals assertion result dot sign count like so. And next up we're going to check to see if the assertion result contains a device public key. 
and if it does we will add it to our list of known device public keys that correspond to this particular credential so what we can do is we can say if assertion result dot device public key is not a null like so then we can say credential dot device public keys dot add and we can then create a new device public key and we can say public key credential id equals assertion result dot credential id like so and then the value is going to be assertion result dot device public key the actual uh, device public key value itself in other words next up what we are going to want to do is update that public key credential within our database so what we're going to do is we're going to say application db context dot public key credentials dot update credential like so and then we can say await application db context dot save changes async passing in our cancellation token now provided that everything has executed successfully thus far we can assume that the user has logged in with a correct and valid public key credential and we can therefore go ahead and sign the user in using the sign-in manager so what we're going to do is we're going to say await sign-in manager dot sign in async like so we're going to pass in our user object that we retrieved from the database previously and i'm going to set is persistent to false which means that when the user closes the browser their session will not be remembered however you can change that to true or set it appropriately based on your particular requirements as i say for the purposes of this sample i'm just going to leave that as false last but not least we can return a typed results dot okay and we can then pass in our assertion result like so so what this method is doing uh, first of all it's going to retrieve the fido2 assertion options from the session it's going to check to ensure that the uh, json string exists within the session and it's not null or empty it's then going to create an assertion options instance from that JSON. We're then going to use the ID from the assertion response that we get from the client to find a corresponding credential in the database. If a credential matching the ID cannot be found, then we are going to return a bad request to indicate that the login attempt was not successful. We will then use the user ID relation property on the credential to look up the user by ID. Once again, if that user is none, then we're going to return a bad request indicating that the login was not successful. Next up, we're going to use the fido2.net library and the fido2 service to make an assertion using the response that we get from the front end client the options that we retrieve from the session, the credential that we retrieve from the database, and then a callback function to ensure that the credential belongs to the user. Next, we are going to update the signature counter of the stored credential based on the result from the assertion. And if a device public key is present, then we're going to add it into the list of device public keys that are associated with that credential. Last but not least, if everything has been completed successfully, then we will sign the user in using the sign in manager like so. So those are the methods that we need in our FIDO2 handler in order to create an assertion and also create the associated assertion options and so next up what we're going to do is within our program dot c sharp we're going to come down to where we have our app dot map post calls what i'm going to do is i'm going to copy those 
and I'm going to say fido2handler.createAssertion and I'm also going to say create assertion options and then I'm going to update the endpoint names to create assertion options and also create assertion like so. This means we've now got four endpoints in total. We've got an endpoint to create assertion, create assertion options, create attestation and create attestation options. Next up, what we're going to do is we're going to move over to the client side code and we're going to create the JavaScript required for login. So what I'm going to do inside the www root folder, inside the JS folder, you'll notice we've already got a helpers JavaScript file and a register JavaScript file. I'm going to go ahead and create a JavaScript file for login like so. And this is where we're going to handle the client side code that gets executed when the login form is submitted on the login page. So what we're going to do is we're going to say document dot get element by ID. And we're going to look for an element with the ID login form. We're then going to add an event listener and we're going to add an event listener for the submit event and then we're going to create an asynchronous uh, callback with the event uh, parameter there and first of all what we're going to do is we're going to say event.preventDefault in order to prevent the default form submit behavior because we're going to be overriding that and instead executing this client-side JavaScript code. So what we're going to do is we're going to say a const and then username and return URL. And then we will say equals object dot from entries. And then this is going to have a new form data instance passed into it. And then we're going to use the event target, in other words, the form in order to get the form data and then convert those entries into an object. We then destructure the username and return URL properties in order for us to use those later on within our script. So next up, what we're going to do is we're going to send a post request to create our assertion options. So what we're going to do is we're going to say let response equals await fetch and within here we're going to say fido2 and then we're going to say forward slash create assertion options and then we're going to pass in the uh, arguments the properties for the fetch init parameter so the first one of these will be the body and inside here, we're going to JSON stringify the username that we retrieved from the form. Next up, we're going to specify the headers. And the header that we're going to want is content type application JSON. And then last but not least, we can specify that this is a post request like so. Next up, we're going to do a check to see if the response is not okay. And in the case of the response not being OK, we're going to throw a new error and we're going to say failed to create the assertion options. If the response was successful, then we're going to deserialize the JSON into a, a constant called public key like so. And next up, we're going to want to convert the properties of that public key object from our deserialized backend format into a format that the browser recognizes as part of the web authentication specification. So what we're going to do is we're going to say public key dot challenge equals and then we we'll say coerce to array buffer and then we're going to say public key dot challenge in order to convert that challenge property into an array buffer. 
Next up, we're going to say for const and then allow credential like so. And then we say of public key dot allow credentials. And within here, we will then say allow credential dot ID equals coerce to array buffer allow credential dot ID in order once again, like we did with the challenge to convert the ID of the allowed credential into an array buffer. Next up, we're going to use that public key variable in order to uh, get a credential using the browser navigator. So what we're going to do is we're going to say const credential equals await navigator dot credentials dot get. And then we're going to pass in the public key inside the credential get options. And what this uh, function is going to do is it's going to open up a UI in the browser, which is going to prompt the user to uh, select a pre-existing public key credential that they have created previously. Next up, what we're going to do is we're going to take that credential and then we are going to post it to the backend server. So what we're going to do is we're going to say response equals await fetch. And then we're going to say forward slash FIDO2 forward slash create assertion like so. And then we're going to customize that request. And first of all, we are going to create the body for the request. And within the body, we're going to want to JSON stringify a couple of properties that we get back from the credential from the browser. So first of all, we're going to specify the ID as credential.id. And then we're going to coerce the raw ID of the credential to a base64 URL. This is going to convert the client side browser format into a JSON serializable format that we can then read in the backend server side code. Next up, we are going to specify the type of the credential. And then we're going to say extensions, and that's going to be credential.get client extension results. Then we're going to specify the response property. And within here, we're going to say uh, authenticator data. And we're going to coerce that to a base64 URL. And that's going to have passed into it the credential.response.authenticator data, like so. Next up, we're going to specify a property for client data JSON. And much the same as authenticator data, we're going to coerce the credential response client data JSON to a base64 URL. And then the third property that we are going to want is the response signature, which is once again going to be coerced to a base64 URL. Next up, we're going to specify the headers for our request. In this case, that's going to be the content type application JSON. And then last but not least, we're going to specify that this is a post request. We're then going to do a check to see if the response is OK. If it's not, then we are going to throw a new error. And we're just going to pop the message in there saying failed to create the assertion. However, if the response is successful, then we can assume that the user has been logged in successfully and we can therefore redirect the user to the return URL. So to do that, we can say window.location.assign and then we can pass in the return URL that we retrieve from the form data at the top of this uh, callback function. So this is the client-side JavaScript code that will prompt the user to select a previously created public key credential. And it will then send that credential to the backend along with the username 
and it will use that to look up the user and if the user is found and the credential is found then it will log in the user and the client side JavaScript code here will then redirect the user to the return URL. So now that we've created our login script, we are going to want to scaffold the account login page from the ASP.NET Core Identity Framework. So what we are going to do is we're going to open up the terminal and like so. We're going to CD into the web application directory like so. And we're going to want to install a couple of packages. So the first package that we are going to want is the Microsoft Entity Framework Core Tools package. So what we do is we will run the command .NET add package Microsoft Entity Framework Core .tools in order to install that package. Next up, we're going to want to install the Microsoft Visual Studio Web Code Generation Design package. So we'll run that command in order to install that package into our project. And then we're going to want to make sure that we have the .NET ASP.NET Code Generator tool installed globally. In order to do that, we can run the command .NET tool install hyphen G .NET hyphen ASP.NET hyphen Code Generator. As you can see there, I've already got that tool installed globally. However, if you don't have it installed globally, then that command will install it for you onto your system. And now, last but not least, we can use that code generator tool in order to uh, generate the login page for identity. So what we're going to do is we're going to run the command .NET ASP.NET hyphen code generator identity and then we're going to specify hyphen dc web application dot data dot application db context that's our database context class and then we're going to specify hyphen fi and then account dot login to indicate that we want the login page to be scaffolded into our project so what we do is we will run that command and that will build our project like so is then going to run the identity generator and if we now take a look within the areas directory we now have an account folder with both the register page that we had previously and we've also now got a login page scaffolded into our project so what we're going to do first of all is we're going to open up the code behind for the login page and we're going to want to update it and modify it in order to interact with our client side login script that we created just a few moments ago. So what we are going to want to do is we're going to delete most of the body here of this class. I'm going to convert that to a file scoped namespace. And the first thing I'm going to do is update the constructor for the login model to take in a sign in manager of type application user, like so. And then within our class, we're going to create a couple of properties. We're going to say public string return URL with our getter and setter. We're then going to say a public list of type authentication scheme like so and we're going to call that external logins again with our getter and setter and then we're going to say a public async task and this is then going to be called on get async passing in a nullable return URL and within the body of this method we're going to say return URL equals return URL or if the return URL is null then we will simply use the root of the web application as the default fallback return URL. Next up we're going to specify external logins and to get our external logins we're going to use the injected sign-in manager. So what we're going to do is we're going to say await sign in manager dot get external authentication schemes async 
and then we're going to convert that to a list like so. Last but not least, I'll just remove the unused using statements there from the file. And this is the code behind for the login page, updated, ready to go. Next up, what we're going to want to do is update the actual login page itself. So what we're going to do within the login page here is we're going to make a few modifications in order to use our login script. So the first thing that we are going to do is we're going to remove the ASP validation because we're no longer going to be posting the form to our uh, code behind. We're instead going to be using that uh, event handler that we created in JavaScript to handle the form submission. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove the references to ASP validation, like so. Because this is passwordless login, we're also going to remove the link to the forgot password page. And we're also going to remove the link to resend the email confirmation. What we're also going to do is we are going to remove the remember me option for the purposes of this sample. You'll recall earlier on that I've set the sign in method to always a default to false uh, with regards to remembering the user after they've closed the browser. However, you can feel free to leave this uh, input in or change that false to true depending on the requirements for your application. We're also going to remove the password because this is going to be a passwordless uh, login. And then what we're going to do is we're going to change the ID of the form to be a login form, like so. I'm also going to change the ID of the login button there in order to match by calling it a login submit. Next up, what we're going to do is we're going to add a hidden input to store the return URL. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an input like so. This is going to be of type uh, hidden. And the ID of this input is going to be called a login return URL. The name of the input is simply going to be return URL. And then we're going to specify the value as a model dot return URL, like so. Next up, what we are going to do is we're going to customize the email field and we're going to change that to read as username, like so. We can get rid of that form label class from the label. And then within the input, we're going to get rid of the ASP4 attribute. And instead, we're going to give our input an ID of login username, like so. I'm going to specify the name as username. We're then going to specify a required instead of area required equals true. And then within our label, instead of specifying ASP4, we can simply specify for and then login username like so. So that there is our login form with our username input and our hidden return URL input, along with our submit button that will trigger the submission of the login form. What we're then going to do is we're going to scroll down to the bottom of the file and we're going to remove the reference to the validation scripts partial because we're no longer using that to validate the form. And instead, we're going to add a reference to a couple of script files. So what we're going to do is we're going to say at script source forward slash JS forward slash helpers dot JS like so. And then we're going to specify ASP hyphen append hyphen version equals true in order to have the version appended onto the URL. And then next up, we're going to want to specify our login script like so. 
again appending the version to the URL. So those are the references to the helper script that we created previously and also to the login script that we created earlier in this video. So what we've now got there is our login page alongside our previously created register page. And what we're going to do now is we're going to build and run the application and log in using our passwordless flow. In order to do that, I'm going to hit the run button there like so. This will then build and start our web application on port 7078. If I open the browser to localhost port 7078, I can navigate to the login page like so. And on the login page, you'll notice that we just have a single username input and there is no password input because this is entirely passwordless using public key credentials. Now, I have previously registered a user and set up a passkey on my mobile device in order to be able to use that for login. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the network tab in the DevTools. I'm going to specify my username there, which is the username of the user that I previously registered with. And then I'm going to select login like so. We can see that the assertion options have been created. We can see that it's picked up the allowed credentials from the database, those being the credentials that belong to the user with the username tnc1997 at outlook.com. What I'm then going to do is I'm going to use the previously created passkey on my mobile device. And if I now check my mobile device, I can see that a notification was sent to the device and I'm then prompted to enter my biometric fingerprint or thumbprint on the device. And as we can see there, I have then successfully authenticated and logged into the application using my fingerprint or thumbprint on my mobile device. So we can see we have the request to create assertion options. And we then also have the request here to create the assertion. And you can see here that we have the assertion that is provided by the client from the browser. We then pass this assertion into the backend server side code. And we then use that to update the credential in the database. And we then sign the user in if everything has gone through successfully. So if we now go back to our IDE and if we open up the database tab here, we can see that we have that previously registered user. And we can see here that we have the FIDO2 public key credential again that we previously created. And we can see that we have the various properties updated on that public key credential. So in this guide, we've gone through how we can use a previously registered public key credential in order to uh, log in using a passwordless flow where we simply enter a username and then the user is prompted to select a public key credential that they have previously uh, set up. In my case, I used a passkey on my mobile device. I then selected that credential, entered my biometric data on my mobile device in the form of my fingerprint or thumbprint. And with that all happening successfully, I was then signed into the application and redirected back to the home page. So in this guide, I've shown you how you can log in using those previously created public key credentials without having to enter a password. This is a more secure login mechanism. It doesn't rely on a user having to remember a password. And because it uses those public key credentials, as I say, it's a much more secure login flow for end users of your web applications. So I hope you found this video useful. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.